Please turn your Bibles to Psalm 73. This will be our Old Testament reading for this morning. Psalm 73. Truly, God is good to Israel, to such as are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet almost stumbled, my steps had nearly slipped, for I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no pangs in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, nor are they plagued like other men. And therefore, pride serves as their necklace. Violence covers them like a garment. Their eyes bulge with abundance. They have more than heart could wish. They scoff and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens and their tongue walks through the earth. Therefore his people return here, and waters of a full cup are drained by them. And they say, how does God know? And is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the ungodly, who are always at ease. They increase in riches. Surely I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocence. For all day long I have been plagued and chastened every morning. If I had said, I will speak thus, behold, I would have been untrue to the generation of your children. When I thought how to understand this, it was too painful for me until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their end. Surely you set them in slippery places. You cast them down to destruction. Oh, how they are brought to desolation as in a moment. They are utterly consumed with terrors. As a dream when one awakes, so, Lord, when you awake, you shall despise their image. Thus my heart was grieved. And I was vexed in my mind. I was so foolish and ignorant. I was like a beast before you. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold me by my right hand. You will guide me with your counsel and afterward receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is none upon earth that I desire besides you. My heart and my flesh fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For indeed, those who are far from you shall perish. You have destroyed all those who desert you for harlotry, but it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all your works. Thus far the reading of God's holy word. Next I would invite you to open your Bibles to the first chapter of 1 Peter for our New Testament reading and the text of the message this morning. i tell you a brief story before reading this passage from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. Many of you know my lovely wife. What you may or may not know about her is that she has a master's degree in speech-language pathology. And years ago, when she was working full-time in that field, she had the opportunity to work with some patients who were suffering from head injuries. 
One gentleman in particular had been involved in an altercation at a pub in which he was struck in the head by a baseball bat. He was recovering fairly well from the extent of those injuries, except that there was one nagging symptom that persisted and that Amy had to work with him to overcome. It was a most remarkable thing. Whenever he spoke, in all of the sentences that he uttered, he would omit prepositions. Apparently there is a portion of the human brain so specialized in the wondrous design of our God that it controls prepositions. And that portion of his brain had been injured. And so he would drop the prepositions from his sentences. If you tried to do that, I, I'm sure you probably couldn't. But he did. Now why do I tell you this story? I tell you this story because I want to call your attention in the reading of these nine verses from the first epistle of Peter to the prepositions. The prepositions in this passage are truly remarkable and are the framework upon which Peter builds his thoughts. With that said, please read along with me as I read 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1-9. to Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, according to His abundant mercy, has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now, for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, you love. Though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith the salvation of your souls. Please pray with me. Our Heavenly Father, how blessed we are to be in Your presence and to sit before Your Word. How blessed we are indeed to have the promise of your Holy Spirit that he will accompany your word and enlighten our minds. O Lord God, how we pray that as we come to your word that we would be teachable, that our hearts would be pliable in your hands, that they would be like the ground plowed and prepared to receive the seed that is planted and that your word would take root and grow and bear fruit. So help us, Father, to cast off distractions and to hear your word and to do it. 
We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. These nine verses in 1 Peter chapter 1 are the introduction of a letter written to a particular group of people, and it's always a good idea when beginning to look at a specific portion of God's Word to get a sense of its context. With regard to an epistle, it's important for us to know who wrote it and to whom it was written. And the author helps us a great deal in that regard by telling us the answer to those two questions in the very first verse of his epistle. The writer, the author, of course, is Peter. We know Peter as we have read the gospel accounts of Jesus' life and ministry that Peter was one of the twelve that Jesus chose to follow him. And even within that structure of the twelve, Peter was one of three of the apostles who were especially close to Jesus, his inner circle, we might call them. Peter was a fisherman. He was rough around the edges. He was an individual who, as we observe his behavior and his speech in the accounts that we have from all of the gospel writers, seems to have been somewhat petulant, given to extremes, an apostle who would vehemently stand upon a particular point only to reverse himself very quickly. Peter was a sincere individual, and one who loved his Lord Jesus Christ with all of his heart. The name Peter was not his given name. His given name was Simon. Peter was the name given to him by Jesus. And Peter means rock. That was the designation that Jesus gave to him. And yet while he aspired to live up to that name, we find throughout the accounts of Scripture that Peter was often too focused on this world. You might recall the account of the Gospel writers when Peter, along with James and John, were invited to the mountaintop where they witnessed the transfiguration of Christ and saw Him in His glory with Moses and Elijah standing there on the mountaintop with them. And Peter's response, Lord, let's build three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. It was Peter who, at the Last Supper, when Jesus was washing the disciples' feet, said to Jesus, Lord, never will you wash my feet. And only moments later, when Jesus had explained the importance, said, well, not only my feet, but my head and my hands as well. It was Peter who, a little too guarding of his reputation before men, had to be taken aside by the Apostle Paul when he allowed himself to be influenced by the Judaizers into not eating certain types of meat and compromised his testimony for the Lord Jesus Christ. Peter was a good and godly man, but like us, Peter was a human being subject to trials and temptations and shortcomings and sin. And yet in spite of all of that, He identifies himself here as an apostle of Jesus Christ. He was called by his Lord, sanctified by him, and sent out as his representative throughout the world. This is our author, one who knew what it was like to live in an uncertain world but to be bolstered by the grace of God. 
Who is he writing to? He tells us he's writing to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Who are the pilgrims? Some of the children are thinking about tall black hats with buckles on the front of them. It's not that time of year, but that's what we typically associate with the word pilgrim. The word has a very specific meaning as we find it in Scripture. It's a word that connotates stranger, sojourner. A pilgrim is one who is displaced from their home. Perhaps someone who is fleeing persecution and therefore has to take up residence in a foreign land, somewhere that is strange to them. It's difficult for us to imagine that. We have been blessed to live relatively comfortable lives, undisturbed and unharassed by specific militant persecution. But imagine if in the dead of night, because of the threat of some violence against you and against your family and against your homeland, without any time to prepare, you had to be uprooted. (coughs) You had to take only the few belongings that you could manage to escape with. You had to be shepherded away under the cloak of darkness and transplanted to a strange place many, many miles away from the comfort of your home. And in that strange place, people are speaking in a language that you don't understand. The customs are odd. They dress differently than you are used to. And the food is very different. These are the pilgrims that Peter is writing to. Men and women, families who had been dispersed throughout Asia Minor, Jewish families who knew Jesus Christ, who now lived among strangers and foreigners and felt alienated, separated, cut off, and strange. We haven't experienced that in a physical sense, and yet there is a very real spiritual sense in which all of us as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ living in the world are strangers. We're pilgrims. We're dwelling in a place that is not our home. We're surrounded by, culture, by cultures and practices that are foreign, and we are a peculiar people, some of us more peculiar than others, but strangers in a strange land. And so Peter is writing in order to encourage, in order to strengthen, in order to anchor these pilgrims and to give them hope. So how does he do this? How does Peter approach this task of encouraging these pilgrims of the dispersion? Well, you might be surprised, but the method in which Peter chooses to encourage these folks is by giving them a lesson in theology. Peter writes to them of the doctrines of God and His sovereign grace. Surprising, perhaps, because we tend to think of doctrine and theology as something sort of dry and separated. It's that ivory tower stuff that they talk about in seminaries and schools, but but it's not practical. Quite to the contrary. Peter understands that the doctrines and the truths of God and His Word and of His dealings with His people are the very anchor that these pilgrims need to keep them grounded and to give them hope and to help them place their own experience in the proper perspective. So there are four specific truths 
that Peter focuses on in these opening verses of his first epistle that we're going to focus on together this morning. And the first truth that Peter chooses to emphasize is the doctrine of election. After identifying his audience, it's the very first word that he uses. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. There's a beautiful structure that we can see here as we look at the text. You remember I called your attention to the prepositions, and Peter hangs these phrases on the prepositions in such a remarkable way. And he builds a picture of the foundation that we have in the electing grace of God. And he relates it to all three persons of the eternal Godhead. It's a beautiful Trinitarian picture that he paints here. He says that you are elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Wow. We could do a six-part series just on that phrase alone. Peter says, you are elect according to, it's literally down from, the foreknowledge of God the Father. So the anchor of election is in God's eternal foreknowledge, in God's sovereignty, and our election proceeds down from God the Father's choice in all of eternity past. It's communicated then, it comes to us through or in sanctification of the Spirit. So God the Father regenerates us and gives us new life and communicates that election, making it take hold in our lives experientially through the interaction of the Holy Spirit that He sends. It comes down from the foreknowledge of the Father through sanctification, setting apart of us in the Spirit unto or toward obedience and the sprinkling of the blood of Christ. And so it has a purpose It has an end. It comes down from the Father through the Spirit unto obedience that we might walk according to the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Peter says to these pilgrims of the dispersion, remember that you are elect. His very first message to them that he would give them to anchor them in the midst of their experiences is remember who you are. Though the world rejects you, God has chosen you from before the foundation of the world and called you to Himself. The doctrine of election provides an anchor for confidence in the midst of trials. No one perhaps expressed this with more forceful beauty than the Apostle Paul in the 8th chapter of Romans. When he wrote, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose, for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called, and those he called, he also justified, and those he justified, he also glorified. What shall we say then in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It's God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Jesus Christ who died, more than that, who was raised to life, (coughs) is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, neither the present, nor the future, nor any powers, 
neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The doctrine of election establishes our purpose in this world in sanctification of the Spirit. Paul summarizes our purpose in a brief phrase in 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, For this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus, your sanctification. The doctrine of election produces Christ-like behavior. Paul writes in Ephesians 2, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not a result of works, lest anyone should boast. And he goes on and adds, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God ordained beforehand that we should walk in them. So Peter begins by seeking to encourage these pilgrims of the dispersion and the Holy Spirit would encourage us with the same thought. That as we think about our displacement in the midst of the world, we have an anchor in the electing grace of God. Second, he points them to the truth of regeneration. Verses 3 and 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope. He's begotten us again. I remember hearing Dr. R.C. Sproul some time ago talking about a memorable quote from one of his seminary professors when he was studying abroad under G.C. Burkhauer. And he talked about how one time Dr. Burkhauer, opening a class on theology, uttered a phrase that R.C. said he would never forget and would carry it with him into eternity. The phrase was this, all sound theology begins and ends with doxology. All sound theology begins and ends with doxology. Sound theology is the discussion of things things concerning God himself. And if we are speaking about a truth related to our God, and if it is a sound description of something of the essence of the character, the nature, the attributes of God, (coughs) then it ought to elicit from our hearts praise, adulation, worship of God. That's what we see happening with Peter here in 1 Peter 1, verse 3. He's just talked about the electing grace of God and hung it on that beautiful Trinitarian structure. And now he's going on to speak about the regenerating power of God by which himself and, and his audience have been begotten again to a living hope. And he bursts out in doxology, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because he has begotten us again to a living hope. So this is what Peter wants us to glean from this. First of all, you are born again according to his abundant mercy. It's not because of who you are. God said to Israel many, many years ago, do not think that it's because you were bigger than the other nations or somehow better than the other nations that I chose you. I chose you because I loved you. We are chosen because of God's abundant mercy. He is the Father. Only truly and properly so of Jesus Christ, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. But because of His regenerating grace, who has taken us who were dead in trespasses and sins and given us new life, breathing it into us by His Word and Spirit, we are able to also call Him Abba, Father, our Lord, and our God. Peter wants us to know that We are born again unto a living hope. 
We need to take some time to define the word hope. It has a different meaning in our usual parlance than it does in Scripture. The word hope we tend to think of as wishful thinking. Well, I really hope that something happens in the future. I hope my favorite team's going to win the championship. I hope that I'm going to do well on an upcoming exam. I hope that this is going to happen or that's going to happen. We're not really sure what the outcome is going to be, but we hope it's going to turn out the way that we like. And that's not at all what the Bible means when it talks about hope. Biblical terminology, biblical hope is the certain expectation of a future reality rooted in the promise of a faithful and all-powerful God. God said that it's going to happen. We believe that God is perfect and that all that he says will come to pass and that he has the power to make it so. But it hasn't happened yet, so we hope. Not with uncertainty as to whether it might or might not happen, but in expectancy that it will come to pass. That's the kind of hope that Peter is speaking of here when he says we've been born again, begotten again to a living hope. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, we have a solid and sound basis upon which to hang our hope. The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Romans 6, verses 5 to 8, Paul writes, For we, if, we have, if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe we shall also live with him. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the foundation and the anchor, por- anchor point of our hope. And so we know that we will be with him. In my father's house, he said, are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you that I might come and take you to be with me where I am. And so Peter says, we are born again to an inheritance. We like to think about the idea of inheritance, perhaps, from time to time. That mystery letter that appears in our mailbox from an attorney's office referencing some long-lost relative who has left us a large check. Peter's talking about an inheritance far more exciting than that. He describes it as an inheritance that is incorruptible, that is undefiled, that is inexhaustible. It's not subject like any earthly inheritance that we might receive to breaking down over time or being diminished in value or fading away. And he says it's reserved in heaven for you. The idea of reserved means guarded to prevent loss or injury. It's not going anywhere. It's surrounded by the heavenly host. It's on reserve in heaven for you. This is the living hope to which you have been born again. Peter's message again to these first century pilgrims and to us, not only remember who you are, but remember whose You are. You're born again children of God in Christ Jesus. The world may disown you, but you have a living hope and an incomparable inheritance. Next, Peter directs his readers to the truth of perseverance. He says, You are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. The word kept is a different word than he uses for reserved in heaven for you. The word kept 
means to protect by military guard, either to prevent hostile invasion or to keep the inhabitants of a besieged city from escaping. We are restrained, we are kept, either from assault from the outside or from our own escaping. God preserves us through faith in the power of God. Faith is the means, it's the instrument that keeps us from being overwhelmed. It doesn't exist by itself, however. Faith must have an object upon which it rests. That faith that we exercise is faith in the power of God. Our faith might wax and wane. It might be stronger or weaker, depending on the situation and the time of our life. And so it must be nurtured and fed by the means of grace. Faith is God's gift to us. It's not your willpower. It's faith in His power. Peter says, You're kept unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. God has chosen you, given new life to you, and is preserving you in order to bring you to the ultimate realization of His promise to you in Jesus Christ. Salvation. A promise that cannot be thwarted by any power on earth or in heaven. Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given given them to me is greater than I, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. And Paul wrote to the Philippians, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it through to completion in the, na- in the day of Christ Jesus. And so Peter charges the pilgrims to remember who he is. Though your faith may falter, you're kept by the hand of the omnipotent God and enfolded in the arms of one who is mighty to save and whose plans and purposes will never, ever fail. Finally, Peter points his readers and us to the doctrine of union with Christ. Having laid this groundwork, groundwork, Peter says in verse 6, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, you love. It's an amazing structure when we look at this entire passage and we see what Peter has been doing in this concept that he's been building. He started with reminding us of eternity past and anchoring us in the fact that God has chosen you from before the foundation of the world. And then he sets before us a vision into eternity future where we have an inheritance reserved in heaven for us, one that cannot fade away. What about now? Now, when we're stuck between these two eternities, and life is hard, and difficulties press us on every side, and we face trials, Sickness, persecution, conflicts, problems of every kind. It's that now that Peter's addressing here in verses 6 through 9. And if we had to boil down his message to its very essence, it is this. You're anchored in eternity past. You're promised eternity future. And in the space between where you face those trials, you have Jesus. 
He's there with you. The one who said, I will never leave you nor forsake you, will walk through those trials with you and see his work through to completion. So Peter says, in these grand doctrines you greatly rejoice, though now, look at the modifiers here, now for a little while. It's that perspective in between those two eternities. The now is but a little while. We all face trials. Peter's not trying to diminish those trials in any way or to dismiss them and say they're not difficult, they're not hard, they're not awful. But he does put them into the perspective of eternity. You may have a trial that lasts for weeks or months, maybe years or decades. Maybe a trial that comes into your life the day that you're born and doesn't depart till the day that you depart this earthly realm. And Peter says, in the perspective of eternity, it's a little while. If need be, he says. Trials through which God places His people are not random, nor are they pointless, but they are purposeful, if need be. We don't always know why they need to come, because God knows us better than we know ourselves, but those trials, when we face them, we have the assurance that they are under the superintending providence of God and they come to us as need be. And over all that purpose, Peter describes in verse 7 that the genuineness of your faith, being more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's through those trials that God builds that godly character in us, that He purges away the impurities and imperfections from our lives and conforms us more and more to the image of His Son, Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, we love. And while we do not see Him, yet believing, we rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. And in the end, we receive the end of our faith, the salvation of our souls. So that's the counsel that Peter gives to the pilgrims of the dispersion, to anchor them in the doctrinal truths of God's electing grace, His regenerating power, the persevering grace that God gives to His people And in all of that, the union that we have with Christ to walk through the valleys of difficulty to the salvation of our souls. May God encourage our hearts with these truths. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we do ask that you would be pleased to take this word of yours and use it to strengthen our own hearts, encourage us, Convict us and bring us grace. We ask these things in Jesus' name. 